God bless. We're going to go into a new section here talking about what Isaiah says uh, about Jesus, what is foretold about Jesus. And before we begin, I'd like to have a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what was accomplished with Jesus' sacrifice for the suffering that he endured, for the torture and for the, the way in which he died and for his three days in the ground and for your raising him from the dead and all that that means to us. And as we've just celebrated the resurrection, and uh, I want to, Father, thank you and praise you and ask for you to give us insight and understanding about the information in Isaiah that talks about these things. I thank you for working in all of us to better understand you and your ways and your son and, and what he did for us and what he is doing now and what he will do in the future. We love you and we praise you. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Chapters 47 through 55 in Isaiah are a large Unitarian section where one thought leads to the next with all being a focus on the Messiah. The content ties, the contents tie together the preceding while it also anticipates that which is following. Today, since it's, it's a time, uh, the season where we acknowledge the suffering and the resurrection of Jesus, I really want to focus on the songs of suffering or the suffering songs. That particular, that particular title is not a biblical title. It's something that a theologian thought up, and that's what they call them. There's four sections that we're going to look at. We're going to start in Isaiah uh, chapter 42. If you have your Bible, you can join with me in, in the Bible. In Isaiah 42, verse 1, it says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one to whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Jesus would have read this information himself. He would have, he would have uh, in his formative years, while he was developing before his ministry began, he studied the scripture. And this section, these sections in Isaiah is really God talking directly to Jesus. This was God's uh, marching order, so to speak. He provides here a detailed blueprint for what Jesus will do in his ministry. It's really, it's an extraordinary perspective. Read, when we're reading this, think of it from the point of view of Jesus reading it for the first time and, and the Father speaking to him through the words of Isaiah. Again, verse 1 says, Behold my servant, and that's referring to Jesus, whom I uphold, I God uphold, I support him, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, he will bring forth justice to the nations. When Jesus read this, he understood, this, there's no doubt that he understood that God was speaking to him. His father had this written so that when Jesus was born and when Jesus was developing and training, that he would understand what God wanted him to do. Actually, this, this helps him to, it helped him to, to know what was going to happen before it happened. It also helped that that. It told him that God was going to support him, that through his life and through his ministry, with all the different things that he would go through, uh, some very negative and some positive, that there God would be with him to uphold him, to support him, and to guide him and to strengthen him. He was not to be alone. He could read this. Not only did God reassure this when he was in his ministry, he knew this before he even started his ministry, that God always had his back. And it also showed Jesus what, he was to, what his life was to be about and what he was supposed to do and how he was supposed to respond in situations as they arose. It wasn't like these situations were brand new to him as they happened. He could read from Isaiah a detailed blueprint of the things that he would face. The way that Isaiah is written is a um, uh, uh, particularly in this, uh, in this section where it talks directly to Jesus, it's interesting how it's written. It's, it's, uh, it's written so, it's written in the past about the future. As we look at it, it was written in the past and it was about the future. So when Jesus read this, he read it as if it had already happened uh, and it hadn't yet happened. Jesus wasn't even born when this was written. It was hundreds of years before Jesus. So 
It, Jesus would read this in the affirmative that this is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to play out. And the thing that God kept on doing for him in these sections and throughout the book of Isaiah is that he showed him the end game. He put before him what would be his hope and what is humanity's hope. He showed him time and time again, yeah, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. The things that you have to do are really, really extraordinary. But in the end, you're going to be victorious. In the end, the kingdom is going to come and you're going to be the king overall. Again, verse 1 says, Behold my servant Jesus, whom I uphold. I support him. I strengthen him. My chosen one, God chose Jesus, to whom my soul delights. Jesus reading this, how that must have thrilled him. And when he recapitulated this in his mind over and over again, and thinking that God, his Father, was delighting in him. I have put my spirit upon him, and he... Jesus will bring forth justice to the nations. Jesus knew that his ministry had a far-reaching impact, not just to Israel. It says to the nations, and the nations is referring to the Gentiles, all of the nations, that Jesus would bring justice to all of the nations. And then verse 2, it says, He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. Jesus, when he came, his ministry, when it, his ministry here on earth, he didn't have a flamboyant presence like royalty would have. When royalty presented themselves then, as is true today, there's this whole fanfare. You get the guys coming out with the bugles and they're blowing the bugles and, and you know, they got, uh, you know, maybe uh, rose petals thrown down in front of them or a red carpet thrown down in front of them and the person comes in on a carriage and they have the, the purple garb and they have the scepter in the hand and they have the crown on their head and there's this just this flamboyant royalty that is presented. Well, of all the people who ever lived, Jesus is going to be the king of kings. He was a prince here on earth. He knew his future was to be the king of the th on the throne of the kingdom of God. He would rule over all, but that's not the way he presented himself. He didn't come in in that fashion. He didn't cry out and raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. He wasn't boisterous. He wasn't loud or pushy. He didn't have this, you know, this presence about him. Not at all. Uh, the people he called, remember, remember how he would, he would call himself, he would call himself the son of man. He didn't call himself the Christ. He didn't announce, don't you know who I am type of mentality. He didn't have that braggarty, braggart attitude, that prideful attitude. Don't you know who? No, no, no. He told people, I'm the son of man. Almost 70 times that's written in the gospels. He referred to himself as such. I'm just a human being. I'm a man. And when, remember when he would heal people and then he would say to them, look, don't tell anybody. He didn't want this loud announcement as to who he was. That's not the way God wanted. Again, why did Jesus behave that way? This is because this is what this says. This is that he knew this before he even started his ministry, that this is the way that he was to present himself. He looked like everybody else. And, and you couldn't distinguish him by his appearance from any other person in Israel. Verse 3 says, A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Unlike other kings, he had this humility and this meekness about him. He would not even break off a reed that was bent over and cracked. Actually, he would help it to straighten up. This is figurative language. What you do with a, a burning wick that's burned out, you cut it, you cut it off, or you throw it away, or you, you know, you, that's not what he did. What he did was he trimmed the wick, he put more fluid in the more oil in so that it could burn. He didn't discard it as other kings and other royalty and other conquerors would do. That's not how Jesus was. A bruised reed he would not break, a dimly burning wick he would not extinguish. He didn't go around hurting people. He didn't use the weak to accomplish his purposes. You, you know, isn't that what all of the armies of the world have done for centuries? They, they take the young people, the young men, the children of the, of the culture, 
the, you know, in our, in our society, you, you get uh, drafted when there was a war, you would, when you were 18, 19, 20 year old, these are the people that would go into war and their lives were expendable, they would die, they would forfeit their lives, to get puffed out. Well, Jesus didn't do that. He didn't use the weak people. He didn't do that at all. He came in in a whole different way. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for him. There would be times of temptation for Jesus to faint and to be disheartened. He fed these thousands and thousands of people and he spoke to them and, and taught them the word. And then the next day they came back and they came back not because he was, they thought him to be the Messiah, not because of the truth of God's word that he spoke, they came back because they wanted something to eat. I imagine that would have been disheartening. Of course, a lot of the multitude left. He even confronted the disciples and asked them if they too were going to leave. This was a time of temptation to be disheartened. I'm sure he was disheartened when, when uh, the different disciples did things that were not in accordance with the things that he was teaching him. There were other times that, like when John the Baptist was beheaded, when that information came to him, how that must have rocked his world. You know, John was such a wonderful man, a godly man, and yet he was degraded and murdered in such a terrible way. That must have hurt Jesus. That might have been a temptation for him to be disheartened, or, which is not too far removed from the time that in Matthew 11 where, where he starts cursing these cities that had the information been told in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would, have, they would do better in the day of judgment than you. And Tyre and Sidon were in a better position than Capernaum and these other cities that did not embrace him. I imagine that was discouraging and disheartening for him. But he didn't give in to it because this scripture said he will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice. You remember the time that the, the, the man came uh, looking for Jesus with his son who was demonized, who was, uh, who was having a similar impact like a, a person who had epilepsy as far as throwing himself down on the ground and throwing himself in the water and the fire. And he came and Jesus wasn't there and the disciples couldn't heal him because of whatever reason. Peter and John and James were up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus came back down. He was told what was going on and the man, he said to his disciples, Oh, you of little faith. When are you people going to believe? When are you finally going to get the point? I imagine that was a time of discouragement and he could have lost heart. Or when Judas came up to him in the garden and kissed him on the cheek and betrayed him. Another time of temptation. Or when he was in captivity being held by Caiaphas and beginning his torture when Peter betrayed him or denied him repeatedly. And he heard the cock crow. But through all of this and so much more, he never gave up. He never quit. He never threw in the towel and said, the hell with it. No, no. He would not get disheartened. And you know, I'm sure that knowing this from before it all happened, knowing terrible things would happen, he knew from the scripture that he was not to give up, not to get disheartened, that things would work out in the end. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. The coastlands, re is, that's a reference to the Gentiles. Uh, and again, this is the second time in just these few verses that we're informed that Jesus was told before time that he would have an impact on the Gentiles. In verse 1, it was told the nations. Now the coastlands, that was understood to be the Gentiles. Verse 5 says, Thus says Yahweh, God, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it, the spirit to those who walk in it. I am Yahweh. I have called you, Jesus, in righteousness. I will also hold you, Jesus, by the hand and watch over you. I'm there with you. No matter what happens, Jesus, I will hold you. I've got your hand. I will watch over you. I will appoint you, Jesus, as a covenant to the people. He explained that Jesus was going to be a covenant to the people, what we now know to be the new covenant. 
not only to Israel, but to all of those who have believed. A covenant for the people and a light to the nations, again, to the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, to those who dwell in darkness from prison. There will be other verses in Isaiah where it talks about Jesus healing the blind. So when that, when that time, that, that record that's recorded in John chapter 9, and they're, they're going by and they're seeing a blind guy, and the disciples say to him, Master, who did sin that this man was born blind? His parents or him? And Jesus said to him, it's, it's not that, that's not what it is. It's so that you will see the work of God done in him. It wasn't like Jesus was surprised that, he, that a blind man would be healed. He knew beforehand. He walked into the situation already knowing. Then a blind man presented himself, said, Father, is this the one? And then he went ahead and did what he was supposed to do. He was just obeying what he had read in the scripture, that he would be a light to the nations. Verse 7, open blind eyes, bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from prison. I am Yahweh. This is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things before they spring up. Go back to verse 1 again. It says in that latter part that he will bring forth justice. And then in verse 3, he will faithfully bring forth justice. And then again in verse 4, until he establishes justice. There is a lot to do with this thing with justice. Three times it's repeated in this section, God telling him. But I think the greatest of all of the justice that Jesus would accomplish would be that God would finally get the honor and the recognition of him being the one and the only God. It would be through the ministry and the sacrifice and all that Jesus accomplished that in the end, that every man, woman, and child who have ever lived would know that Yahweh is God and that Jesus is his son, the Lord of glory. That would be the greatest of the justices that Jesus would accomplish. There'd be a lot more, but certainly the most significant of all. Jesus, I'm telling you what's going to happen before it happens. Look at uh, chapter 49. This is such an extraordinary way to consider the ministry of our Lord. I think a lot of times we, we consider reading the Gospels that this, he would go into these events and it was like it would, maybe could cold cock him or shock him. It was a new, but he never acted that way. He always acted with poise, with confidence. He was never rattled. And the reason that is is because it wasn't a surprise. He knew these things were going to happen before they happened. Last Wednesday, we had a communion service. It happened to be the Passover that day. Sean was sharing and teaching, and he made reference to Psalm 22. It's a psalm about Jesus. He talked about what was going to happen on the cross. So when they took him out to Golgotha, when, they, when he was on the road, he knew what was going to happen when he got there. It wasn't a surprise that they took his hands and they put spikes in it. He had read it before and knew that that was going to happen. He knew the torture that was going to take place. We'll, we'll read in a few minutes. He, that's why he went when he was in the garden. He said, Father, if this cup can pass from me, please let it be so. Because he had read and known what was required. So he's on the cross. He's seeing, he's seeing what, I, what, what was written in Psalm played out. And so was his life. So many things that would happen, he would say, okay, well, this is exactly what was foretold by my father. So I could be prepared to not sin in the situation, to do what was right. Look at chapter 49. O oh, islands, listen to me and pay attention, you people from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named me. Even before Mary conceived, she was told what his name would be. This was all pre-planned. God had it all set up from the ages. And Jesus now reading this would understand that he was a part of all of that. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has concealed me. And he has also made me a select arrow. 
He has hidden me in his quiver. He knew that the words that he would speak would pierce and they would accomplish what God sent them out to accomplish. As it says in Isaiah 55, the word of God did not return unto him void. Just like the rain from above and the snow, it accomplishes what God intends for it to accomplish. And Jesus' words, what he would speak, would be as a sharp sword. God and, and, and God had him covered as an arrow in his quiver. God's protection was on him. And there was, he was one arrow among many. There was the secrecy that God held in this mystery. Verse 3, he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I show my glory. He calls his servant, Jesus who is his servant, he calls him Israel. Because Jesus was the true Israel of God. Jesus was what God had always wanted Israel to be. He wanted them to be a nation of priests. He wanted them to be his children, to live a godly, holy life. And they failed so miserably at it. But Jesus was the true Israel of God. So when we read, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. Indeed, that is exactly what Jesus was. He was the one in doing what he did and living the way that he lived. He gave glory to God. He was the glory of God. People would understand that he was God's son. He was the extension of God and therefore bring the glory that God always deserved. In verse 4 it says, But I said, I have toiled in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vanity. Yea, surely the justice due me is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. I, I had talked earlier about the record in Matthew chapter 11. It's a very um, intriguing section because Jesus has come to the realization of understanding that he wasn't getting across to the people where he had spent most of his time in the, the area of Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee, that the people in these cities, they weren't embracing the truth. They weren't accepting it. They were rejecting it. And it was disheartening, to say the least, but not to the point of him wanting to quit. And, and, but it was hard. It was very hard. That's why it says here, again, Isaiah prophesying about the future as if it was in the past. He said, this is what Jesus would end up saying. I have toiled in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Jesus would feel that. He, he knew before it happened that he would feel it. When he was feeling it, he said, oh, this is what God was talking about. Boy, I don't feel this is working at all. Yet, surely justice do me is with the Lord and my, my reward with my God. He understood that it wasn't about what he would see with his eyes. It wasn't about the response of the people who were with him at that time. He knew that his reward was with God. He knew that what he was doing was going to be blessed by God and maybe rejected by man. And not maybe, it was rejected by man. They ended up crucifying him. But he didn't, he didn't allow it to dishearten him because his reward was with God. He knew what God had promised that he would be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So he continued on. However, in that section, we see that what he did when he was feeling this way, he prayed. And I want to read this prayer to you from Matthew 11 in verses 25 through 30. At that time, when he came to this realization of having toiled in vain, his strength being spent for vanity, he prayed, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, this way was well-pleasing in your sight, and things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. He said, no one understands me except for you, and no one understands you except for me. In the face of all of the rejection of humanity, it didn't matter. <laughs> because Isaiah told him, 
The most important thing of all would be, Jesus, that God understands you. Your Father understands you. And you will understand Him. And then he goes on to the disciples and he says to them, because they too were discouraged, they had just come back from understanding the death of John the Baptist and, the, and seeing again the same type of thing that Jesus saw. He said to them, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Go well, back to Isaiah 49, and in verse 5 it says, And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. I know Jesus felt this way, that he would have felt honored in the sight of Yahweh, and that my God is my strength. To a certain degree, I, I have that, that feeling, certainly not like Jesus would, but I have experienced the same kind of feeling, and perhaps you have too, that you would be honored to understand what you understand about God, that you would be honored to have the life that you've been given and uh, the blessings that have been bestowed upon you because of Jesus. I remember when I was at my high school reunion, my 40th high school reunion. Unfortunately, it was a while back, but I, uh, there was thousands of kids in my class, and I brought up in Long Island. It was a big school. I don't know about thousands, but there was at least a thousand. And, and uh, I, we, were, we were seated in a big restaurant sitting at different tables, and it just so happened at, at the table that I was seated at that there were people on, on my block. There was my, my next door neighbor, uh, uh, Lorraine Rivera. She was sitting right next to me. And then next to her was the, the next house over was Linda Rapp. She was sitting there. And then two houses down from that, Vivian Greco was sitting there. And then uh, at the other end of the block, Gabe Silverman was, we were all sitting at the same table. We were all brought up on the same block. We all went through elementary school together. We went through junior high and high school together. All these years later, we're gathered together we're sitting at the table and we're talking about things. I'm telling them of the wonderful things that God has done for me in my life, where I am at all these years later. Not, and and uh, ironically, a gay Silverman who was brought up Jewish, here she, she was a devout Christian. We were praising the Lord together, speaking about God. Afterwards, I reflected on this and I thought, man, who would have ever thought that me, of all the kids on my block, of all the kids in my school, that God would choose me to know Him. To the small degree that I do, that God would give me the glorious honor to do what I'm doing right now, to speak to other people about Him. How honored I am, how blessed I am, how thankful I am that out of why, why God would choose me and select me, I don't have an answer for that. All I have in my heart is gratitude and thanks because it is so. And I'm sure that, that I, I'm, Jesus, the, this is what it says, that he was honored to be the Father's Son. He was honored to bring glory to God. He was honored to be the substitutionary sacrifice for humanity and to, for him to be the vehicle by which Yahweh was going to bring Jacob back to him that he was going to be the one that was the instrument that God would use to pull Israel finally back to him, which has not yet happened, but it will happen. It will happen that Israel will turn back to him. And back in, in verse 5, I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. Verse 6 says, He says, Too small a thing that you, Jesus, should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. It's too small a thing just for you to be about Israel. All that you're going to go through, all that you're going to endure, it's more than just Israel. It's going to be about all the nations also. Wow. Jesus would read this. He would understand what his life was all about so that he would be, he would be focused and synchronized on, on doing the things that God wanted done. He knew that he was the, the way in which God would redeem humanity 
and, and put right everything that was wrong in heaven and on earth. It was read, it was, he could read it in the Bible before it even started. He knew all of this. Glory. And verse 7 says, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to the despised one, to Jesus, to the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers and kings will see and arise and princes will also bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Thus says Yahweh in a favorable time, I, Yahweh, have chosen you, Jesus. In a day of salvation, I, Yahweh, have helped you, Jesus. I will keep you, Jesus. I will give you, Jesus, for a covenant of the people, to restore the land, to make them inherit the desolate heritages, to say to those who are bound, go forth, to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. Along the roads they will flee. Their pasture will be on the bare heights, and they will not hunger or thirst, nor will the scorching heat of the sun strike them down. For he who has compassion on them will lead them, and will guide them to springs of water. I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways will be raised up. And continues to go on to explain that which Jesus will accomplish through his ministry, through his suffering, through his death, and through his resurrection. Isaiah chapter 50. The Lord has given me the tongue of disciples, that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. God trained Jesus. Those, I, I guess we believe that Jesus' ministry started when he was 30 or thereabouts. All of those years preceding that, God would be awaking him in the morning and training him. I, I, I think of what it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, 52, and Jesus, this is when he was 12 years old, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in the favor of God and men. He kept on increasing in wisdom and stature. God trained him. God taught him. There was this training and teaching. He would read Isaiah and God would give him the understanding about what it would mean, as not only Isaiah, but the other information in the Old Testament. The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I don't know if this is literally what happened. It's not recorded in the Gospels, or figuratively. It's a humiliating thing. It's a painful thing to pluck out the beard. I would give my back, back to be striped. To, he was whipped over and over brutally by a cohort of Roman soldiers. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. I have set my face like a flint. I know that I will not be ashamed. Who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up to each other. Who has cause against me? Let them draw near to me. When they were raging at him, when they were spitting in his face, when they were making accusation after accusation and humiliating him, he knew that those who spoke badly of him meant their words were meaningless because in the eyes of God, he was innocent and that he was just in what he was doing. There was no one that could stand up against him. Verse 9, Behold, Yahweh God helps me. Who is he who condemns me? Behold, they will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them. Jesus, knowing this, as this is going, as Caiaphas, as Annas, as Herod, as Pilate, as the cohort of soldiers, as all of these people were dealing with him, he knew their time would come to an end. They're all dead in the ground. They're dust. Their bodies are no longer in existence. They're history. He still lives on. He's in, he sits at the right hand of God waiting the day that he's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They're gone, all of those who falsely accused him, for he did nothing wrong. Verse 10, who is among you that fears Yahweh?
that obeys the voice of his servant. If you fear Yahweh, you obey Jesus' voice that walks in darkness and has no light. Let him trust in the name of Yahweh and rely on his God. Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands, walk in the light of your own fire among the brands, set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. And chapter 52 is the next and the final place where it talks about the suffering servant. In verse 13, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. His appearance was marred more than any man. Let me, let me look at, slow this down here. Again, verse 13 says, he tells him what's going to happen. Again, Jesus reading this, knowing that eventually he will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. And then in verse 14, he's told about what he must endure, the suffering that he must endure. Just as many are astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any. That, that talking about the people being astonished at Israel, it's, uh, in, we had looked at this in a, a different session in verse 5. Look at verse 5. Now, therefore, what do I have here, declares Yahweh, seeing that my people have been taken away without cause? Again, the Lord declares that those who rule over them howl, and my name is continually blasphemed all day long. As people were astonished, when he, this is talking about when they were in Egypt, God was blasphemed by them because of their terrible behavior. And then when the Assyrians came, again, because of Israel's lack of faithfulness to Yahweh, the people were astonished at them. Well, with Jesus, when they saw him suffering like he did and going through what they went through, they thought that this was the result of his sinfulness and Yahweh's punishment. Look at, at, at chapter 53 in verse 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried. We ourselves esteemed him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. That's what they thought of him. When he was hanging on the cross, when he was suffering as he did, they thought that God was the one that was punishing him for his wrong behavior. How wrong they were. Again, back to 52. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations, Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. That sprinkle many nations. I, I was trying to figure out what this meant. The particular Hebrew word that is translated sprinkle, every place that it's used, it's in the context of sprinkling blood, like in the blood sacrifices. And, and perhaps that's what it's talking about here. He will sprinkle blood on many nations. As a result of what he had done, his blood will cover for the sins of all nations. Kings will shut their mouths on a kind of hand. He's going to bring down all the mighty ones. They're going to shut their mouths. They're not so mighty. For what hath been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. Nobody understood that this was the blueprint of God, all written out, all rehearsed to Jesus before time, so that Jesus knew it all. And when it came to pass in his life, it was a matter of whether or not he had faith in what God had already written in the scripture. Jesus' ministry, he is, it says in Hebrews 12 too, he is the founder of faith. He is the leader of faith. Everything that he did was as God wanted done. Everything he said was what God wanted said. And a lot of it was written very specifically in the scripture. The prophets talked about it. Isaiah is jam-packed with this information. So when it came to it, when Jesus was doing it, he was being obedient to what was already pre-written before it ever happened. That's what faith is. Faith is obeying what the scripture said. He would read what the scripture said that he was supposed to do, and then he did it. Uh, so that verse, that verse uh, 15 that I was talking about, no one understood it at the time that it was going on. Afterwards, now we all can understand exactly what it was all about. In chapter 53... Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root 
out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him. He was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrows, and the, the Hebrew could have been translated a man of pain. Acquainted with grief, it could have been translated sickness. And like one from whom men hid their faces, hid their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Twice in that one verse, it says that he was despised. He was hated, he was loathed, he was thought of in such terrible manner, in such terrible way, in order that they would put on him the incredible torture that they did. For a man who did nothing wrong, who lived perfectly, sinlessly, who lived in love, who only gave. He was a man of pain, he was a man of sickness, and like one from whom men hid their face. When they, when they got done with him, I'm sure people couldn't look at him. They turned their face from him. In his life, when he needed help, when somebody should have stood up and said, stop this, you shouldn't be doing this, nobody did. Nobody stood by him. He was all alone. It was only him and the Father. He was despised and we did not esteem him. We didn't, we didn't esteem him. We didn't value him. We didn't, we didn't come to his defense. All of his devout followers were hiding, protecting themselves. Surely our griefs, our sicknesses, he himself bore. And our sorrows, our pains, he carried. We ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastisement, the discipline, or the correction for our well-being, our completeness, fell on him. Everything that would make us right because of our wrong fell on him. He took our place. We are healed. And by his scourgings, we are healed. By what he did, we are now healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. I went to a meat packing factory once. I was uh, looking for a job there. Decided I didn't want to do it. Those sheep, they would lead one by one on their way to being killed. And they had no idea what was, they, they you know, bah, they had no idea. They didn't speak out. Pilate said to him, don't you have an answer for yourself? Don't you say anything here? Annas said to him, or Caiaphas said to him, don't you have an, don't you respond? Tell us, tell it. Remember, he wouldn't talk. You know why he didn't talk? He might have wanted to, but you know why he didn't? Because he was obedient to the scripture. He read this. He knew that this is what he was supposed to do. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with the wicked men. He was with the rich man in death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He might have been buried with the wicked, but he himself was rich because he had done everything that God wanted him to do. He did it all without sinning. He died on the cross when he said it was finished. He did everything that was predetermined that he would have to do in order to redeem humanity. And in his grave, he was rich because he was the conqueror. Of course, when God got him up. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. He would render himself a guilt offering. And that's such an important phrase there. Jesus was the guilt offering. It says the same in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that we were made the righteousness of God because he was, our sin was put on, that he was the sin offering for us. All the way back from the very beginning, starting with Cain and Abel, God had Abel offer a sheep, a lamb, as a sacrifice. And then all the thousands or maybe millions of sacrifices that would have followed throughout Israel, all those sacrifices, they were all types 
for the substitutionary sacrifice that Jesus would do. All of that was, but nobody understood what God's plan was. Jesus read this and he knew that he was to be the sacrificial lamb. That by his doing what he would do and dying as he would die, that as a result of that, humanity would have the opportunity to be redeemed. That everything that was wrong in heaven and earth would be straightened out. That God would finally get what God had always wanted. As a, Verse 11, as a result of, of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. There you have that justified again. He will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Verse 12, therefore I will allot him, Jesus, a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong because he poured himself out to death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He himself bore the sins of many, interceded for the transgressors. I want to back to verse 11. As a result of his anguish of soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Verse, verse 10, And the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. In that time, when Jesus was going through all of this, you know, all that he saw was the pain. All that he felt was what was going on. But he knew from this in Isaiah that he would see the fruit, the offspring of his suffering, that he would eventually see you and see me and see those that have believed through the century. He would see that the result of his sacrifice was not in vain. Actually, it was the completion of God's plan for the reconciliation of all humanity. These are the, the wonderful uh, songs of suffering or the suffering songs that are written in Isaiah that help us to understand more about our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.